Hey, and welcome to this tutorial on Blueprint Organization. This is the last part of a three-part series going over the basics of Blueprint communication through to the advanced process of interfaces and ending with the organization of your Blueprints. I'm going to show you some of the processes of organizing your Blueprints and also how you can actually gain some performance in your editor and in your game just by organizing your Blueprints properly. So yeah, with that said, let's get into this tutorial. So tip number one is reroute nodes. If you have a line going through one of your nodes, you can double click on the line to create a reroute node to rearrange it around your blueprints so that it's easier to read. Also, don't be shy with reference nodes. If you have multiple blueprints going across multiple lines of code or even your entire graph, I would advise using as many references and variables as you like so that they're closer to the nodes, making it neater and easier to read. Another great feature, especially if you're working in teams, are comments. If you either drag select some of your nodes and right click and go down to create comments or drag select and press C, you can create a comment. You can name it wherever you like. And if you go up to the top right, you have some options. You can click this little button so that it's easier to see when you're farther away. And you can also change the color. And let's say it's blue because it's a rotation. And this just makes it a lot easier for your team to find things around the graph. I would definitely recommend color coding things, especially if your team is working on a copy of your blueprints. For example, movement nodes could be yellow, calculations can be blue, and health could be green. So another important node is the sequence node. If you have any long lines of blueprints like this, and if at any point along this chain something fails, for example, we have a is valid node here. If this object isn't valid, anything beyond this point won't play at all. So it's much safer for your blueprints to be played via a sequencer because each line will be executed independently and in a sequential order. So we can either create a sequence node by holding S and left clicking or you can right click and search for sequence like this. And all we need to do is add the number of pins that we need and then connect up the execution lines. Chuck that guy in there and that's our setup. This will now play in a sequential order going from zero to the highest number. And even if this rule fails, it'll still execute all of this. So another nifty trick is straighten nodes. So sometimes in blueprints, these nodes won't straighten properly, even if you try. So if you select all of these and right click and go down to alignment, there's a couple of alignment tools here. So usually I go for straighten connection or press Q like this. However, I would recommend going up to your editor preferences here, opening this guy up and searching for align and setting your own custom presets here. As standard, there's shift plus S and alt shift S and stuff like that. But I tend to make more custom ones here. So for example, B is bottom and R is aligned to right. Functions are also really handy. Um, if you drag select all these nodes and right click and go to collapse function, you'll create a node that's super efficient and it's actually supposed to be executed in one frame. This however means you can't have any nodes within them that affect time, so you can't have delays or any timelines like that. And this can be reused throughout your blueprint and duplicated as many times as you want. You can also double click and go into it. So you can now connect this pin up and then use this with any actor, like the sphere of the cube, and use that for a reference to drive the code within the function itself. One of my favourite features is actually the collapse nodes, which is essentially like a little folder of nodes. If you select all of these and right click and go down to collapse nodes, unlike functions this doesn't actually happen over one frame, so it just collects all your nodes and minimises them into like a little folder. So if we name this cg underscore set location and you double click in here and it has all your code in here and you just need to connect this guy up like that, that's you. And that will keep your graph neat and tidy and actually help with performance within the graph itself so it's not too cluttered. Oh, and I wanted to let you guys know that I'm working on a game called Button Pop. It's a mashup between tower defense, an idol, and a button masher game where you are the main button and you have to defend yourself against all the other little jealous buttons coming to get you. If you're interested in the game or have any feedback or any ideas of cool buttons or hats that I could add to the game, leave a comment down below and check out all my devlogs I've got on my channel. I really appreciate your guys' feedback, and yeah, with that said, let's get back to the tutorial. Another great feature is enums. 
enums are basically just a list. So if I go over to this variable here, um, it just has a list of names here. And what this allows us to do is use two flow control nodes here. And one of them is called select. And this allows us to select from a list of variables based on what we have picked within the enum. And the switch node, which is actually very similar to the sequencer node. However, the switch node will execute a path based on what value the enum is set to. So you could set it to option 01 and it would only execute option 01. Or you could set it to option 02 and it would only execute option 02. And the way we actually create an enum is if you go back into your content browser and you right click and go down to blueprints and click on enumeration. And we call this enum underscore test. And we double click on that. And we can create our own little list here by clicking on new. And if we stick in test A, and we copy that, and we make a new one, and call this one test B, and we make a new one, and we call this one test C. And we save this and go back into our blueprint. We can make a variable type down at the bottom left. And we call this enum test. And then if we go up to the top right with that selected under variable type and search for enum test. And now when we drag this in here and compile, we can see that it's populated by the list that we've made. So we can actually add and remove items from this list and it'll update within your blueprint. And instead of this value just being static, we can now drag out and make a select node. And we can chuck that guy in there. And you can have an array of variable types like this. And the selection of the variable type will be based on what you have set in here. And it's much the same as the switch node where we create a switch node like this. And we connect these guys up like that. Delete that. The flow of this will be dependent on what this is set to. If we set this to test B, it'll go through this execute pin and ignore these two. And this is really useful when it comes to setting up game modes and maybe different modes in your character, you know, depending on what level they're in or maybe what state they're in. So if your character is like injured, you could have like a sort of injured mode and then that will only call that code specifically within that mode. Another neat trick is to use custom events to reuse code. So if we make a custom event and name this set location like this, chuck this in here. You can now call this event anywhere in your blueprint. So if we right click and type set location, this can now be used anywhere. So instead of using multiple copies of this, which is very inefficient. You can now call set location like this and get rid of this and just reuse the same code over and over again if you want. Plus you can feed information through custom events so you can connect this guy here and up into the here and delete this guy. And then when you go back to this node here, you can connect up the cube or the sphere or any other actor you'd like to then get that specific actor's information on the fly. And this can be a really powerful tactic when it comes to collapse nodes. So if you double click in here and we get rid of this guy like that and we create a custom event and let's just call it set location like that and chuck that guy in here and we compile this and go back to our event graph. This is just a node sitting on its own and we can kind of and we can kind of just chuck it in a pile of nodes if you want. But because we have the custom event in it, we can actually call this from anywhere in the graph. So if we right click and type in set location, we can call this wherever we like, even within other collapsed nodes, keeping the graph clean and tidy. Another neat trick is to use the set timer node. So if we drag out and type in set timer. This will allow you to call an event every set duration. So if we put this to one and stick this onto loop, every one second this will call an event. And if we just create a custom event and call this timer like this, and we call our set location, 
This will now call our set location every one second until it's broken and you can break it by dragging out here and typing in clear and invalidate timer. And you can just create a custom event here to just clear the timer whenever you want. And just as an extra tip, timers are actually a really good alternative to event ticks. So if we come down here, event ticks are the most expensive event to have in your graph. It's okay for small things, but if you can replace this with something like a timer, it's a lot more efficient. We can just replace this here and you can actually set the tick rate by going here and setting the time to a lower number, so let's say 0.1. And this would be how fast it would update. So instead of it being every single frame or every single tick, it's going to update every 0.1 of a second, which is a lot slower than tick rate. But let's say you're set on using your event tick. You can actually set your tick rate by going up to class defaults and going over to tick interval and setting that to a higher number. So you can set this to like one, which would be one second, but you can set it to higher or lower than that. However, just watch this value because if you've got something connected to your event tick here that affects rotations or location based sort of stuff, this will affect how smooth uh, the movement is. So this will definitely depend on the case by case basis if you can use this, but it can really help with performance if that's an issue for you. And one of the last things is try and stay consistent. If you're going to use naming conventions, pick one and stick with it. Don't have long form here and short form here. Just keep it all the same so it all makes sense so that anybody can follow along. Also, if you're going to be using colors to guide people around your graph, stick to your guide. So if you, let's say, use yellow for locations or vector based stuff, always stick to yellow for vectors in. Don't suddenly use yellow for something else. It can make things really confusing for someone looking at your blueprints for the first time. And if you can make your blueprints look consistent, your team will be able to follow the flow of them and find issues really quickly. So if you're doing any testing of your game and you actually have your blueprint window up, you're going to be losing a lot of frames that you would actually be getting in a proper build of your game. So the actual best way of testing your game out would either be to play your game in standalone mode or to do a flat out build of your game. That will give you the purest form of your performance. However, if you're testing out your blueprints, you're going to want to monitor them in your editor. Um, so to get the best performance and your testing at the same time, you want to actually keep your window as clean as possible because it's also going to be rendering your editor. And the more you have in your blueprint that's visible, like all these nodes and whatnot, it's just going to bog down your performance which is actually part of the reason why it's better to compartmentalize your graph as much as possible. So if you can minimize your blueprints with collapse nodes and functions, this will help a lot with your performance while testing. And if you're going to be monitoring, you can just double click and go into these collapse nodes and functions to view what's happening while you test your game. Also, because at the end of the day, you're going to be reusing a lot of this code with your custom events, functions, and collapse graphs, you're going to be saving a lot of horsepower with your end game since you won't have a lot of duplicated code all over the place. And you should be able to get a lot more performance out of your game. So yeah, I think that's the end of this tutorial. If you guys haven't checked out the rest of this series, uh, go have a look. It's got some really cool stuff, especially with the interface section. And if you guys want to see anything specific from me with tutorials, just leave a comment down below. I've got a few devlogs up now for uh, Button Pop, so if you're interested in that game as well, go check out my channel. And yeah, I guess I'll see you guys later. Bye!